kind of half SKS by uh, Dr. Dobinsky from Poland. Uh, but the most famous and maybe controversial uh, technique in this, uh, in this family is certainly uh, the SKS. So this I won't say anything more. The trouser legs and seat is also another technique described in the past by uh, Antonio Colombo. I don't think uh, it was a also, uh, we were using also uh, manually crimp stands, so this is only for histori historical interest. Thank you. Thank you very much. And to go on, we would invite Alison Morton from Northern General Hospital in Sheffield to come and uh, give us an overview of a routine SKS stenting. Okay, good evening, um, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alison Morton. I work in Chef, and I'd like to present to you a case of SKS. Um, this is a 75-year-old gentleman who presented to our hospital with a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. He, had a, he was a chronic smoker with a history of COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, had hypertension, um, and very bad osteoporosis and also varicose veins. Uh, he came up to the cath lab, and I'll first of all show you his left system. As you can see, there's a distal left main stem stenosis, which is a 111 classification, with a lesion in the proximal LAD and also in the circumflex, and he had a blocked right coronary artery. So we started the case by putting in an elective balloon pump, um, and here's a spider view showing his bifurcation disease. Here's an REO caudal view of that, and you can see there's a filling defect there. And again, sorry, back one. <laughs> You can see, in, sorry, in the RE cord view, there's a filling defect there in the LAD. So we um, perform a lot of SKS in Sheffield, as I'm sure my colleague will go on to tell you, and our approach is to pass two wires down and start off with kissing balloons, which we did here with a 2-0 balloon in each of the LAD and the circumflex. Following uh, the pre-dilatation, here's the same view showing that really hasn't made a huge amount of difference and one thing we know is key to the SKS technique is to get very good preparation of your lesion. So we went back with the two, two 2.5 balloons, again at high pressure. And we were reasonably happy then with the results that we got and went on to um, position our stents. Now we always size our stents according to the size of the vessel. So here we've got a, a 3.5 by 24 millimeter taxis in the LAD and a 3.0 by 20 millimeter taxis in the circumflex. And we position our stents right back to the ostium of the uh, left main. We look at this obviously in, in several views to position that, the AO cranial often being the most useful. They're always implanted at high pressure, at least 16 atmospheres. These were implanted at 18 atmospheres. And the results post-implantation can be seen here. And again in the spider view. Now we were a little bit uncertain and happy with the result of the proximal LAD. Um, in this case, so we went on to do IVUS of both vessels, and I'll just show you that IVUS now. Okay, so this is an IVUS of the LAD. See some disease in the distal vessel coming into the stent, which is well deployed. And you'll see when we reach the left main, you get the, some residual disease, and then the catheter actually jumps back out, confirming, I think, that we weren't very happy with the deployment in the proximal LAD. Again, with the circumflex, this is distal vessel with some residual disease, but the stent itself looked very well deployed. Let's run that through. We are coming to the stent, the say is well deployed. Back into the left main with the cuboid appearance of the stents where it abuts the LAD stent. <coughs> so we were fairly happy with our circumflex stent, but not happy with the LAD stent, so we went back 
and performed further balloon inflation, and we use NC balloons, so non-compliant balloons at very high pressures. These, in fact, are inserted at 28 atmospheres. Sorry, I'll just show you that. There you are, there. So 28 atmospheres, non-compliant balloons, and the final result. So we perform a lot of SKS in Sheffield, which I'm sure my colleague will tell you about. So over the last five years, we've done a series of 141 cases, um, majority for lesions like this. Thank you. So if we can have light, please. So you ha I had such a case, I think, two years ago, and I was wondering if to use two stents like your case or just one stent. Before telling you what I did, how many people in the audience will use just one stent in, in this case? No one. <laughs> okay, two people. So most of the people will use two stents. In the same case I had, I used two stents exactly like you, and the patient came, came back within four months with stent thrombosis in one of the branches. So it can be a disaster, especially using two stents in acute MI like these cases, but most of the people will still use two stents in those. Okay, I thank you, Dr. Morton. Ah, oh, there is a question. Just a short comment. You said that after the pre-dilatation, uh, since the result was basically not much different from the baseline image, well, not a good pre-dilatation than we did uh, further pre-dilatation is always a good idea, but I don't think you have to see the result because in that case, you know, it's just a recoil of the plaque. Sure. To judge the quality of the pre-dilatation, you have to see the expansion of the balloon. That's the key point. That was yeah, only sure. I mean, I, I would just say one thing we have learned in this technique, it's key to getting very good pre-dilatation yeah. and making sure you've got access. And maybe the, the very line. last point, uh, you went to 28, but the balloons were so long that you waste most of your radial force where you don't need it. You have mm -hmm. to focus short balloons, uh, make all the difference. Thank you, Carlo, for your uh, comments. Uh, thank you, Dr. Morton. And uh, I will ask my co-moderator, Dr. Lance, to present the next case. Dear colleagues, dear colleague chairmen, I would like to present <clears throat> a case, a kind of a disastrous case, just to make the point that uh, V-stenting can still be effective. This is a stent thrombosis in a 42-year-old uh, male who suffered from myocardial infarction uh, with an LED uh, thrombosis and was stented in the proximal LED. And uh, suddenly during the night he had uh, severe chest pain and a new ST elevation and uh, was uh, readmitted to uh, the cath lab. And the first angio shows a stent thrombosis in, a, in the quite long stent. We did an IVUS and there was a well stent expansion but there was a slightly dissection just in the end of the stent. What we did was try to remove most of the, uh, uh, the, the thrombosis material by, uh, by uh, uh, use of a rescue catheter by thrombectomy, but wasn't successful. The catheter stuck all the time, and uh, despite changing of catheter and removing of material, there was still a lot of debris left in the vessel. So we put in, as you might appreciate, a filter wire and tried to loosen up some of the material by balloon angioplasty. And I have to admit that I did the procedure myself, and um, you will see uh, one of the big mistakes you can do when you have an inflated balloon and try to retract it in a vessel which is not totally evacuated. Because the next <coughs> slide shows the problem. There was a severe proximal embolization threatening the, uh, uh, the healthy circumflex. Again, I tried to, to make some thrombectomy with the uh, export catheter and uh, succeeded in removing some of the material, but the rest, as you can see, wouldn't uh, disappear. Put in a new wire, and again, unsuccessful, uh, unsuccessful thrombectomy, and then 
there was the question on what to do. The patient was uh, deteriorating and the uh, systolic pressure was dropping and um, there was not much to, to do and uh, there was a problem with, uh, with extending the procedure. So what we did, or what I did, I have to admit it, I made a kissing uh, uh, V-stenting just trying to catch the uh, embolic material, placing the stents like Eve told us in a V fashion and employing the stents simultaneously with one inflator and a U, uh, a U connector making this exactly the same pressure in both balloons. And this was the acute result but uh, the pressure was still dropping and the patient was in cardiogenic shock. We inserted a, an aortic balloon pump. He went to the uh, intensive care unit for three days and was then uh, readmitted to the uh, ordinary ward. He left hospital after 14 days and after one month, the final result uh, angiographically was like this. There's still some slow flow in the LID and maybe uh, uh, some uh, over expansion of the stent, but it was the result. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? You can make comment. I think this is an, a very nice case because um, it's not the first time I see that when uh, you are dealing with a uh, thrombus containing lesion at the ostium of the LED, you always concentrate on the result on that vessel. And there is the risk to forget the, the possibility of retrograde uh, thrombus uh, shift that can be deadly. I remember at least two cases uh, of patients who died for this. So regardless of the technique you have used, uh, what I would like to suggest to share my experience, always remember all this at, at least uh, place a wire in the circumflex. So you have the time uh, to inflate the balloon and give some flow there. Uh, ju just one comment about uh, 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 use of thrombectomy. Uh, uh, in this case, because the vessel is big, I think we need a big device. Yeah. And in this case, uh, I prefer is to use a seven French device yeah. compared to six, six French because you are not able to suck everything with a six French. So in when the vessel is bigger than 3 pi, I think it's better to use a, big, a bigger one. Yeah, I, I totally agree. One of, uh, one of the things we have been discussing after the case was you could use the mother and child technique and make the suction on the, on the child. It could be an option. And of course, I, I agree with the, with the two wire techniques. This was an acute case and uh, the, uh, the option was to be quick, but uh, it, it was not a very good option in this case. So it was a teaching case and I learned a lot, I should say. Can you comment on two things? One, on the antiplatelet therapy that you gave the patient on in hospital and the long term. And the other thing is, uh, what about cardiac CT as a fellow method instead of uh, bringing the patient to the cath lab once again? Uh, it, in, in the acute case, I, our algorithm is, if, if, if people have chest pain and ST elevation, we take them acutely into the cath lab. And uh, uh, it, it's just what we always do. The patient had uh, a real pro for when the, at the first intervention, two years prior to the stent thrombosis rate. And I think uh, looking back in the, f the film from the prior um, uh, treatment, there it, it was possible to see the dissection when you knew it it's, it's was there, but the real pro wasn't enough. I gave him half a, I gave him bolus dose on top of the other, well knowing that it could induce some um, some allergic reaction, but I took the chance. And he was on 10,000 units of uh, heparin uh, during the acute procedure as well. Afterward, we put him on lifelong Plavix treatment. Do you, do you use the double do dose Plavix? Sorry? Do you use the double dose no. in these cases? No. Well. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, why Just not? Just because. We <laughs> use. <laughs> Double dose Plavix in these high risk cases, and especially in cases of diabetes, they have uh, some partial resistance to Plavix. So, in these cases with high risk procedures such like this, and patients with acute coronary syndrome, especially with diabetes, we use double dose Plavix for two, three weeks at least. And what do you but think about sorry, the. Sorry, well, no well, that, no that the in, in the acute situation, he was on Plavix 
from, from the first procedure. No, but I mean after discharge. After discharge? Yeah. Just use Plavix uh, double dose for two weeks, three weeks. Well. Yeah, yeah, the, the, there was a dissection, there was some, it was of course a kind of a, a mechanical problem, but, but uh, the reason for the Plavix treatment on the long run was the double barrel carina in the V-stenting. And, and we don't use a double dose, we use 75 milligrams of, of Plavix for one year in Denmark, but we postponed uh, this treatment. You had a mechanical problem within the first stent that caused the thrombosis. It wasn't uh, necessarily a Plavix issue or antiplatelet therapy issue. So I'm not sure about the rationale for the double dose Plavix there. Please. You haven't shown us anything about LV function. And uh, the reason why I'm asking is because I haven't seen any case where uh, the, the uh, try to fix a thrombus by a stent has any success. Usually you cut the thrombus with a stent and send the material downwards, which is not good for, for peripheral perfusion. So um, I wonder whether anybody has a, a, another impression, but I think as soon as you have a good flow, just leave the thrombus there and put the patient on, on plated inhibitors and maybe low molecular weight heparin and the thrombus will dissolve within two or three days and you have much better then check your function results. I, I agree in, in, in the consideration, but this is an acute case in, in a patient with, uh, with a cardiogenic shock. And I think you have to go to the best revascularization technique in the acute situation. Uh, I didn't show the left ventricular function, but you could appreciate from the movement of the vessels that he had a problem in the anterior wall, but the circumflex was right, and his, his ejection me. fraction was, was 40 at one month of follow-up. Let's have small comments for him. Yes, one comment on the double uh, dose of clopidogrel. Um, because it's not based on data and we know we have hyperresponders as well as hyperresponders and it can be dangerous. So my advice in this situation is always do platelet function testing and then you can uh, administer by a tailored way because uh, two-thirds uh, are adequately tre treated with uh, a regular dose of uh, clopidogrel and the 10% are hyper responders who has bleeding complications despite the regular use of Plavix. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's move to Dr. Uh, Murasato from Japan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, disappointing result of death deployment for the LMCA has been recently reported by Dr. Price. TLR was 44% and mass was more than 50%. This, uh, this disappointing result uh, is strongly uh, suggested to be uh, owing to SKS because the uh, treating region was uh, performed by SKS 68%. Uh, we encountered the resonance case after uh, SKS for the bifurcation region like this. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> like this. Uh, and we treat the, the uh, SKS uh, for, the, for this region. And finally, we got an uh, uh, excellent result. Uh, however, uh, six months uh, later, uh, follow up CAG showed the resonance at uh, LCX Ostium here. Uh, in careful uh, fluoroscopic observation, uh, we find the resonance uh, occurred the uh, crossing point of the two stents. Uh, we investigate the uh, stent condition after SKS using three dimensional uh, phantom model. Uh, these are the microfocusity images of SKS using different size uh, stent in the LMCA. Uh, you can see uh, this This is a, a 3.0 cipher stand and this is a 2.5 uh, cipher stand. Uh, you can see the LSX stand uh, crossed over the LED uh, and uh, there is a small gap uh, crossing, uh, just beneath the crossing point. Uh, in the cross section view, uh, you can see the LSX stand cross over and uh, uh, in the proximal uh, LMCA compressed uh, by the LED stand. 
and just beneath the crossing point, there is a gap. Uh, this is a uh, uh, SKS using the same size stance in the LMC model. In the cross section of view, uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, this is the uh, circulating view. Uh, And uh, there is no compression of the LSX stand. Uh, red line and blue line indicates uh, LSX and LED stand. And same size expansion of the two stands led to the half moon shape. Uh, this is a case of long kissing stenting. And uh, in the cross section of view, ah, sorry, uh, this is a 3D view <laughs> here. And in the cross section of view, a red line indicates the uh, LSX stent. Uh, you can see the twisting of the two stent in the pro uh, proximal LMCA. Uh, and uh, it might be difficult uh, to recross the guide wire uh, in each lumen uh, because of the its complexity. Uh, this is, is the case of the LED diagonal model uh, with a bifurcation angle of uh, 14 degree. Uh, in the cross section of the view, uh, at the side branch ostium, uh, the uh, loose overlapping minimizes the gap. Uh, these are the city figures of B stenting in the LMCA. Uh, in the cross section of the view, you can see uh, the minimal stent overlapping with the lateral position of the stent maintained. And uh, you can see the minimal distortion of the proximal stent. Uh, this slide uh, shows the classification of the stent expansion at the proximal site of SKS. In the type 1, 2, uh, the dilated area was round and was in the actual lumen area. In the type 3 and 4, uh, the dilated area uh, was oval and uh, stent uh, is uh, dilated to trans uh, transversely or longitudinally. Uh, we uh, investigate the difference uh, between uh, difference in the vessel direction in the proximal main vessel between SKS and uh, single stenting uh, with kissing balloon technique. Uh, in the bifurcation uh, model with 45, 60, and 80 degree. Uh, this is a magnified view of the uh, proximal stand end. Uh, in each experimental setting, SKS uh, shows the uh, over shape uh, direction, uh, like uh, type 3 or 4. Uh, stent plus KBT also shows the uh, over shape direction. Uh, we compare long axis, uh, short axis uh, distances, as well as dilated area. Uh, in each experimental setting, uh, SKS uh, showed a high, higher value uh, compared to stent plus KBT in short, uh, short axis uh, and uh, dilated area. Uh, this uh, might uh, imply uh, SKS has a potential risk of uh, over dilation in the proximal main vessel compared to single stenting. We also investigate the effect of bifurcation angle or stent, over, uh, stent overlapping style. In the narrow angle bifurcation, uh, stent uh, expand uh, with lateral position maintained. And uh, however, uh, according to the degree of the uh, stent uh, bifurcation angle, stent expand uh, uh, longitudinally crossover uh, uh, style, and uh, finally it changed to an X shape like this. Long-term follow-up metal cutting has been concerned, and uh, the data was recently uh, published uh, from Korea. 47% uh, of the region uh, was covered by Inchima, and which was uh, related to only two cases. Uh, in case of proximal resources of dissection, uh, uh, we should consider uh, proximal stenting. Adding one prox proximal stent simply uh, requires careful positioning. Uh, in order to minimize the gap formation and to avoid the crushing of the side branch stand. And 
in this experiment, uh, you can see that there is a big gap between the two stands, be between the proximal and the distal stand, and there is some distortion in the side branch ostium. And you can see is a di some distortion in the proximal side branch. Another option is uh, adding one proximal stand following the crossing of the side branch stand. Uh, we suddenly cross the side branch stand and uh, cro recross the guide wire to the LCX, uh, kissing battle inflation was performed. However, 3D uh, cross section view showed. This third person, uh, there is a, a double shape, incomplete crash, uh, and uh, proximal stand. Uh, so uh, the guide wire recrossed the uh, proximal part uh, of the metallic carina and slipped into the LCX root and to uh, LCX. Uh, therefore, the confirmation of the guide wire uh, position is very uh, difficult. And uh, this method is only acceptable in case without intimate coverage of the metal carina because uh, further access to the uh, side branch. Uh, in summary, uh, these techniques uh, are non-complex and speedy and safe. safe. However, uh, this uh, technique includes some troubles, uh, uh, some problems. Uh, requirement of large guiding catheter, uh, artificial metallic carina, which uh, may be uh, related to the future trouble, uh, over dilation in the proximal member cell, gap formation beneath the crossing point of the two stent, and difficulty in the additional treatment, and longitudinal stent overlapping in high angle bifurcation. In conclusion, uh, we should select the case with a wide angle bifurcation for this technique. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, we have room for a very quick question from the audience. And if it's not the case, just thank you very much for yes, a very sir. interesting presentation. And now I will introduce Dr. Julian Gunn from Sheffield, who would lead us through how to do the SKS. Julian. Thank you, Johannes. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Dear Chairman, thank you very much for asking me to come and give this talk. I feel a little bit like, uh, who was it in the lion's den? <laughs> Daniel. Daniel in the lion's den. I'm the bad guy coming to tell you why SKS is a good thing. Now, we've seen some frightening pictures from Dr. Murasato, and I think it's very important that we have seen them because there are some important lessons that I've learned from his work, and I'm very grateful to him. First of all, this is not a good technique for LAD diagonal or for circumflex obtuse marginal. It's an excellent technique for left main, and it's very bad if it's a long calcified left main. I think you'd agree. Let me start by um, showing a case. And this will illustrate, I think, very clearly some of the issues. This lady was 74, and uh, she presented to our unit. Oh dear, that's not good. That's not good at all. Okay, we'll try it the other way around. That's this simpler. Is because the technique is bad. No, it's <laughs> not. It's nothing to do with that. So I'll start with the presentation and see if we can show you the case at the end. I come from Sheffield, which is an industrial town in the north of England. Not quite as pretty as Prague, I'm afraid, so it's a great pleasure to be here. Eve asked me to summarize the literature, and I was amazed when I looked at the literature, which I thought I knew, and that our good friend Antonio had in fact described this technique as long ago as 1993, and that was followed by Paul Tierstein describing it using Palmer-Shatt stents crimped on the balloon. Extraordinary. And contrary to what we've just heard from Dr. Murasato, there's actually some very good clinical data. And we see there 
a series from Sharma et al. in 2004 showing really comparable results to provisional T, followed up by a series of his of 200 patients. We've heard about Kim et al. We've seen some pictures, but actually the clinical results, not too bad. However, there are concerns and particularly raised was incomplete stent apposition. And of course, we've seen the CT reconstructions. We published our own paper a year ago in CCI on our first 30 cases with full angiographic follow-up, some IVUS, and I presented that at this meeting last year, so I won't go over that again. And we see that some, there are a series of relatively small descriptions of the technique. So before I start on our results of the 141 cases, perhaps I can show you what happens when you deploy these stents in kissing formation in a latex artery that's constructed with the same Young's modulus as a real artery. So this isn't a perspex former, it's actually got some compliance to it. And you can see that in actual fact, the expansion of the stents can be very good when done properly. So, to our results, 141 cases. These were all comers, and I do underline that. We only turned down one case only, and I show that picture on the right. She was a lady of 72 with good distal vessels, no comorbidity, and a massive thrombus sitting in her left main. And like Yen's case, well, unlike his in a way, I decided not to do PCI and sent her to the surgeon instead. She did very well. However, 42% of this series were actually unsuitable for CABG. The mean age was 67. 75% were male. No less than 11% were in a catastrophic state. They were in an emergency situation. 24 were urgent with an acute coronary syndrome and 65% elective. There was a large burden of other vessel disease, a mean of two vessels, and as you can see, we have a policy of maximum revascularization, so virtually two vessels were treated, as well as the left main. The key point of this technique, as Alison Morton has told you, is that it's simple and the technical success rate is incredibly high, and that is in all angles of bifurcation, because we find when we put the wires down and predilate, the wide splayed angle often narrows. There was a high usage of DES, exclusively paclitaxel, a low use of IVUS generally, though we're increasing that, a very high use of balloon pumps reflecting the high risk nature of these patients, and quite a long follow-up. Our first case was done four and a half years ago and the last one last week. The median is 30 months. We've had 13.5 deaths over that 30-month period. If you look at the bottom there, you'll see that the patients that are still living had a very low New York risk score, 0.6, a relatively low percentage of emergencies, a lowish percentage of balloon pumps, and a fairly high amount of other vessel disease. The converse is true of the patients who died long-term their score was high. A lot of them were emergencies. It was a high balloon pump use. To look at the deaths, five out of the emergency cases died. This was at day four, six, seven, seven, and 28. And these were predominantly cases of cardiogenic shock. Seven out of 34 died. And you can see the distribution of time intervals. Bear in mind that when you read randomized controlled trials, you very rarely get 30 months follow-up. And seven out of 92 elective cases died at day zero, which was a rupture of the left main, the only one we've had. Day five, three months, three months, six months, 10 months, and 24 months. One patient was in extremis when I tried to do the procedure due to other problems. But of concern on this slide are the deaths that are late in the elective group. But I do stress there was a high percentage of surgical turndowns due to serious other illness. TVR is very low in actual fact. 
In our practice, we don't now do routine angiography. We did for the first 30 that we published, and only eight out of 141 have required TVR. That's 5.7%. Seven responded to repeat PCI, which was relatively straightforward, with no particular problems at all, and only one patient had cabbage. Here's another example showing very clearly Murray's law at work. And this is another distinct advantage of the technique. When you have a very large caliber left main and medium-sized distal vessels, a single vessel, a single stent technique is always going to be challenging. We have done it in other vessels, but I would stress that it wouldn't be my first choice. In summary, as you've seen from Alison's case, and I probably don't need to show mine now, we generally use an eight French catheter. Generous predilatation is important to ensure that the stents achieve their optimal position. Taxus is what we've used for historical reasons. We use um, magnified views in two or three projections. We cover all the disease in the distal vessel and therefore choose long stents when appropriate. We size them one to one to the distal vessel which again achieves Murray's law perfectly because the proximal cross-sectional area, in case those of you are wondering why Murray's law is 0.67 in diameter, it's because the two areas are the same, uh, is perfectly achieved with SKS. We advance the two stents, pull them back. We ensure that they cover the entire left main back to the ostium. We do achieve high pressure dilatation with a non-compliant balloon. All the patients so far are on dual antiplatelet therapy, and I entirely agree with the comments of the last speaker on the front row. We've started doing clopidogrel testing because we believe now that these rare late deaths are probably due to patients not being clopidogrel responsive. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for a really nice and perfect presentation, which was exactly on time. Ah, despite the technical difficulties. So now we have room for some discussion. Three. Yes, ju just a short question. Uh, one is about uh, the, the deaths that occurred in uh, uh, non-acute patients. So the 92 patients, there were seven deaths. Yes. What was the cause of death in these patients? Okay, we don't. I think it's very important. Of course, it's vital. And our follow up is meticulous. And I've been completely honest in our long term results. We don't know in about half of them, but they died suddenly. So we have to assume stent thrombosis. I think we have to assume that. Okay, so 7% sev so stent thrombosis? Not as high as that, but, uh, no, but getting on that. You have, okay, you have seven deaths in uh, 92 patients, okay. and at least half were sudden deaths. Yes, so, yes, okay. okay. So yeah. at least five are stent thrombosis. So I'm sorry, the last point? At least, at least five patients are uh, stent thrombosis. At least five, yes. According to the org definition. Yes. So it's relatively high. Yes. yes. But I stress, Thierry, what I said before, which is that this group of patients is not your average outpatients. No, A lot I, of them I, I are surgery. The, uh, the only deaths that occurred in... in uh, planned patients, but you have also 19 deaths in patients who were unplanned. Yes. Okay, so it, uh, it is a source of concern. But these are patients, of course, that the follow-up is long, and they have a high attrition rate. And it, as you well know, if you look at cabbage patients who've had left main disease, they have twice the mortality rate of triple vessel cabbage patients. And a lot of these patients, 42%, were surgical turndowns. Okay. So th the other point is... Uh, long-term antiplatelet therapy. So of course. You, you suggest to give platelet antiplatelet therapy for life in those patients. That's what I've recommended, but that's based on no okay. scientific data. I just haven't got the courage to stop it. But because these patients are old, <coughs> they will have surgery at one time. So yes. How do you manage this problem? I had one patient who had a brain hemorrhage, actually. He survived despite <laughs> the surgeon stopping the clopidogrel not telling me he'd been in hospital and telephoning me two weeks after he left to say that he'd had a brain hemorrhage and he'd stopped the clopidogrel, was that okay? Mm. One last question. Yeah, just a <clears throat> nice presentation. I was wondering about your recommendation about covering the entire left main. Yep. 
And in the case of a large left main, uh, that's relatively normal. My practice, and I agree that this can be a good technique in that sick patient with a severe bifurcation yes. left main disease, um, is not to necessarily cover the entire left main and to minimize rather the, the amount of double carina that, uh, that, or the neocarina that, that you generate. Mm. I think the results actually could be not bad, though I don't have the, uh, the numbers, uh, stats to show it. No, well, I have had bad experiences in the early days with that, and I've learnt to bring the proximal end of the stents out into the aorta by about a millimetre or two. The reason is that on IVUS you often find there is disease in the left main, and therefore when you get the, the oblate ovoid two stents together, that deforms the plaque and you get a step down which looks quite ugly. And on one case, I got a dissection. And then you either have to extend the two barrels of the SKS or attempt to put a single stent there, which is even more difficult. And on two patients, I can remember I had to do that because of a proximal dissection. Since then, I've had no problems. I think a very long left main, and they're very rare, an extremely long left main that's heavily calcified because of what we've seen from Dr. Murasato. I wouldn't use this technique. You, you could ensure uh, that you have no problems with IVUS. Uh, you, you could, providing you could do something about it after the IVUS. Just one, one comment. Well, I think you use uh, the technique for the best purpose, which is emergency treatment of yes. uh, left main uh, bifurcation disease, uh, because uh, it has all the advantages of the simplicity and uh, yes. of getting an immediate good result. You, have, you are in a unique status also to check the long-term result. Yes. And I advise, instead of doing a simple angiogram that shows this funny uh, um, uh, interluminal defect uh, linear inside the left main, yes to do an OCT, which is doable oh. if you use a, a non-occlusive technique. Yes. So you need a big guide because you have to replace completely the blood, but it's a short segment you have to examine. Well, perhaps I've sent my patients to the Brompton then, and you can do the <laughs> OCT. <laughs> Very happy to come to Sheffield and help yeah. because I'm so interested to understand what's it there. Yeah. I mean, we already see more and more that when you have struts in the yeah. middle, for, exam for example, the ostium of a bifurcation, the mm. way they re-endotelialize is they probably uh, thrombosis, so you get a very large mm. uh, amount of tissue around, which shrinks over time. So we'll be interested yes. to confirm in this uh, unique model. Yes, I mean, last year I did show pictures of this thin membrane that you get of the metal, touching the metal. And on our 30 angiograms, we saw that in about five or six, but of course you have to have the angiogram orientation exactly in line with the carina, otherwise you don't see it. But it is there, so it does completely re-endothelialize, and we've done some pig work also, which we've published, which also shows with tax stents re-endothelialization. Thank you. <coughs> Aqua. Do we have time, Eve? He's the boss. Okay, Can he Daniel's going to leave the lion's den. If you don't have other questions, I thank all the speakers. I don't think the kissing stent has emerged as the first choice technique, but uh, still uh, <laughs> the race goes on and uh, maybe next year it will convince all of us. Thank you again. So Dr. Chen is not here, was not able to get uh, a visa from China, so David uh, Felix Smith will help me and uh, Fredo Galassi. Uh, it's a pity that Dr. Chen is not here because he's also uh, 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 using the uh, crush technique. Uh, it, will, it will have been a good uh, discussion with uh, Alfredo. So just uh, we spend a few seconds to explain what we are speaking about now. This is the S family. I will just focus on two points about crush. Historically, uh, crush was considered as the crush of the stent lumen. So, and uh, I heard earlier by John Hormiston that 
we have now a second kind of crush, which is axial crush of the Simon state. So I think for it to, have to be clear, we have to keep the first definition. Crush is the crush of the lumen of the state. I propose that. So when you are dealing with this technique crush, you know also modified distancing technique was described before crush by Antonio Colombo. And we can say that crush is an exaggerated modified distancing technique. But the difference between, between the two techniques, I think the only one difference is the, the nature of the angle. If you have an acute angle between the two distal vessels, you are doing a crush. And if you have an angle which is right, you are doing probably a modified distancing. In majority of cases, modified distancing. So the, the suggestion maybe by Dr. Ikishi was done that when you re-enter to do the kissing, the cybran strand through the lumen, this is not a crush, this is a modified T. And if you re-enter the stent of the side branch through the first cell, or the second cell, or the third, this is a crush. I think we can agree on that. So this is to clarify the, the problem. Because we heard earlier that we have now a second kind of crush, which is axial crush of the, of the stent. So that's all for uh, the moment. So we can move. So we can move to the first presentation. will be by, by, by. Uh, First case, case. Oh, I don't, I don't understand that. So you are, you are doing the presentation, yeah? I don't understand. Ah, you, you, uh, Yoshinobu has also a presentation, but you, you okay, you begin. Okay, uh, I go Fredo. first. Yes, I understand. Okay, that. let's see if it works. Can I have the slide on? So um, I will uh, okay. I will go. I will skip this. We are here right now, so we know that uh, we have to treat first the side branch stent, and here is uh, my topic to show you how the mini crash is improving. I think a little bit the result of the standard crash, and I would say that first of all we have to. I have to thank. Uh, uh, both Antonio Colombo and Maurice Buchbinder, with whom I worked uh, for the last three, four years, uh, because we discussed quite a lot regarding this approach, and I think we refined this crash technique because of this big discussion we had. So technically speaking, this is the paper that we published, and I, I really ne need to thank also uh, John Ormiston for the work he's been done there in, in, in New Zealand. So we, I will explain to you, we, we put the two wires, and here we are. Then we put the first stent, and uh, <clears throat> at this stage we have the balloon here. We usually check this projection on two different angles, and this gives you the idea if you, if you, if you are really into the, in, inside the vessel with the side branch stent. And then you inflate the side branch stent, and you are still having the balloon here, okay? So this is something that is important because I think that this is something that is making a little bit of change and is improving a lot the result of the crushing. Because you are crushing now with a balloon, and this is what you are doing right now, instead of a stent. And I think the friction between the two stents may, uh, you know, make the things a little bit more complicated than the balloon. Okay, then you take it out the balloon, you put a stent, we, never ne we have never had problems, and then you inflate your stent, and then of course uh, is the usual problem of uh, kissing, we try to be as close as much to the carina, and then, then you do the, okay, you do the um, kissing with the two balloons, and, and this is the phantom, and everything is fine because it's in the phantom. But let's go now to the results. And okay, these are just to show you that this vessel that we, where we start this uh, first uh, uh, study, we actually had very, uh, quite small side branch. So we didn't really uh, have big vessels. And also stenosis was quite, uh, um, you know, uh, impressive. Okay, the results were uh, focusing, of course, on the TLR. 
and under stenosis rate, main branch and side branch. But what was interesting that this 14.2, the total, was mainly due to the brain branch. And if we look at the location, it was mainly due to some restenosis at the distal end. But when we look at the bifurcation, we realized that this was very low. And this really you know, impressed us because we realized that uh, we were treating really diseased patients. So we were treating, we were putting a lot of stents in the main vessel and stenosis might have happened here or there, but not in the target bifurcation. So that's something that is something we have to keep in mind. We also had recently some uh, uh, patients with OCT, and this is uh, uh, a patient that we did on, uh, on LAD. And as you can see, there is complete strata position and also quite clear opening of the side branch at this level. And also when we go on the diagonal and we redraw the diagonal, it's quite impressive that uh, at the side of the bifurcation there is quite clear uh, minimal strut, um, uh, optimized tense strut opening, but also minimal uh, superposition. So we went, we went uh, along with this technique and we compared this technique in our lab against the T-provision one stent or two stents in case the second stent was needed because the first stent provision was not successful. And this is a paper that has been accepted finally after many years on the Jack intervention. And here you can see that the groups are not complete, I mean, not, not very different among them. Uh, I can tell you that the presence of type 1 1 lesion was quite representative in the three groups. And uh, also um, the characteristics of, of these patients were similar. And here we have, of course, uh, uh, I, uh, I want to show you that jail wire technique kissing balloon was performed as much as possible. And uh, once again, the two problems of uh, TLR and target bifurcation vascularization, and these are the results. We realized that basically two years clinical follow-up with follow-up of uh, uh, angiography follow-up of 80% of patients showed us that basically TLR, myocardial infarction, cardiac attack, community mass race are not different among the, the three groups, but still target bifurcation vascularization is uh, decreased. And when we look at the main and the side, we realize that both of them are quite low. Of course, are not as low as they were in the first study, but now we are having about 20, 229 lesions. But still, I think there is quite a big difference. And I would say that probably the two stent in the second, one stent, two stent technique are probably higher than the generally reported cases. When we, uh, we, were, we were asked by the reviewer to correct for propensity score, and this is what is coming up, that basic restenosis uh, for main and side branch are coming significantly when we compare to one stent. And when we compare to the whole entire group, uh, is also target bifurcation revascularization is coming up. So this means that if you have two stent technique because of a failure of the T-provisional, you even increase uh, the favor of the mini crash against this group. And uh, this is an example of a patient with uh, um, uh, stenosis of the diagonal and the first and the LED, you can see here. And here is the technique as we be performed, the kissing balloon first. And then uh, we put the stent. As I told you, we check the stent in two different projection. This is also is tell us where exactly the, 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 the proximal stent is. And then we inflate the stent. Then we inflate the balloon, we crash. So we crash with balloon, we don't crash with stent. Then we put stent and then of course uh, is the most interesting part which is the correct entry point of guide wire as uh, was um, shown before that of course uh, we always do with a jail, jail wire so that we know where we are with the first wire and this is the results of the, uh, the final result of the lesion. And these are the studies that has been shown in the, this paper recently by John Ormiston. And with the mini crush, but I think in that, study, in that study, he assessed the mini crush with a stent, 
on the main branch, he realized that classical crash against mini crash is decreasing a lot, side branch ostral area stenosis, this phantom, and this tells you that, uh, of course, in this, uh, um, in this uh, very nice, elegant presentation, that despite being 30 degree or even 90 degree, and I agree with Linus Valve for the concept of uh, modified T, but we have quite good uh, area, luminal area inside. So this is another example where basically we have uh, this lesion here on this diagonal and this lesion here on the proximal plus we have a CTO. We usually do CTO quite often in our lab and what we face is that when we do CTO we have many bifurcations at the end of the procedure. So we have also much, dis much distribution of the plaque. So we want to save this bifurcation. This is an example that tells you that there is an obstruction of the vessel here. There is a, a, a stenosis, but probably the diagonal, I would say that is quite uh, good. It's free of stenosis, it seems to be at least in this projection. So uh, we first put this stent here and in the distal part of the diagonal, and as you can see, has been fixed here and probably something has happened, probably the two wires, we reopened the vessel, I don't want to go into the details in the reopening of the CTO, but it went through quite easy. Now we are having this problem here. Remember that the stent is from here to here, is not here, it's not, that place has not been treated, so we decide to do a uh, mini crash again, and so we did it. We implant a stent, we crash with a balloon, we exactly assess in the two projection the beginning and usually the marker should be on the line of the of the main branch stand and then of course crashing with the balloon inserting the, the stand then redraw the uh, as usual leaving the wire behind the stand inserting the second wire and then at the end the kissing result the kissing balloon and here is the result that show you that when the vessel, although there is quite big, uh, um, I would say, a round curve of this vessel, the, the opening of the strut is excellent. We also assess, and I'm almost finished, uh, the uh, technique for the treatment of the trifurcation lesion. This is a paper that is, uh, is coming up next uh, month on neural intervention. There are five cases with uh, uh, trifurcation lesion. Uh, most of them were treated with cipher, but in one case there was also um, 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 paclitaxel. As you can see, there, always, there is always gel wire technique, either on both branches or at least on the two branches. Uh, here you can see that, of course, trifurcation has higher and bigger value, but we have of these five patients follow up. This is something interesting, and I'll show you just one case that it was not started to be a uh, trifurcation because we thought that this vessel at the beginning did, was not um, needed to be treated. And so what we did, we, we did the first kissing and probably a shift, a shift of the plaque. Of course, we put the stent, okay? and probably a shift, uh, sorry, I didn't show you the shift of the plaque uh, before. Okay, so there is no lesion here. And then uh, after, as, as you can see here, there's a shift of the plaque on the first. So at this stage, we thought that this lesion might have been treated by this mini crash, and so we end up to, to start first, uh, we, uh, we start first uh, to treat uh, the, the first lesion, and this is a, a technique that you can use uh, uh, bifurcation by bifurcation, so you don't need to treat uh, the, the two lesions together. So first we did, we did the first, then of course we crash, and then we did the first diagonal, sorry, we did the second diagonal, then we did the first diagonal, and of course the balloon, and we crash, here's the stent, here's the other stent, and then at the end, of course, uh, we crash uh, all of it, and we insert the stent, and uh, here is the result uh, with the triple kissing, final triple kissing. This is the result, as you can see, there is perfect opposition of the three stents, and this is more interesting is uh, the follow-up. Of course, there are only five patients, so we can't say a lot, but uh, I would conclude that saying that the mini crash technique, and I would stress that it's mini crash but by balloon. Otherwise, the double uh, balloon technique that Chen is, uh, is describing, I think is very, in, in a must, 
if you if you want to do with stent, it's good. Experimental bench work as well, I was in OCT, um, I would say that show good result, and I really thank John Ormiston for her, his advice. And I think that the application of this technique in the clinical setting of both bifurcation and trifurcation, in the case of very diseased vessel, may be proved to be promising. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Alfredo. I think we we don't have time to for, for questions. We will have questions at the end after the presentation of uh, uh, Dr. Zavik. So now it's a case presentation by uh, Vladimir Zavik from Toronto General Hospital, Canada. Thank you very much, uh, Eve and co-chairs. Um, this presentation will be shorter because my second one will be longer. So hopefully it'll all add up to 20 minutes. Um, what I'll show you is a case of a modified balloon crush technique that we uh, described uh, in uh, CCI last year, uh, or two years ago actually, and uh, one that actually went bad on based on which we actually further modified the technique closer to Chen's technique. And the, I think the details of the two I'll discuss in my second presentation, but certainly welcome comments if there's time. So this was um